all good to be here and worship together. If you're a guest with us, we welcome you to First Baptist Church. There was an order of worship on your way in. Hope you receive those. If not, you can wave down one of our ushers, and they will be glad to, to give you one of those. On the order of worship, there is a Connects card on the end of it to get a little information, that, and we can see more information about our church and what's coming up in the, the life of First Baptist Church. So please fill that out for our guests and for our uh, members as well. Please fill that out so we know your presence here today. And on the other side, there are some important opportunities and things coming up that you can sign up for. Uh, the Lemonade Mini Conference is the last call to sign up for this. This will be a great time, uh, August 21st. And uh, so the register the deadline. Uh, for the deadline is today. Now. <laughs> so, so if you want Lemonade ever again, sign up. <laughs> Down below that is the Disciples Pathway. Uh, they will be going through this uh, War of the Worldviews, and uh, today's message will kind of touch on this today. So, uh, just think about that as we're going through today's message, we'll be, they will dive even deeper more into worldviews. And I think that just helps us as a Christian to, to respect where other people's points are coming from, but also to share the gospel in the specific ways that, that we can share Jesus to their world. And it's very helpful to know that going in uh, when you're talking to someone. Uh, down below that, the One Day Fun Day. This is an opportunity we have um, to share the love of Jesus and just to celebrate foster care families. So this will be a day, uh, just an event for our foster care families and for those kids in the foster homes down at our park. And we need some volunteers. Uh, we are looking uh, Specifically for some uh, adult volunteers, 18 or older, that's just because uh, uh, we're having other children there that are already in the foster care home. Um, so we're looking uh, for adults to be there and not just classmates that are going to be there necessarily. So that's, that's the reason for that. Uh, if you cannot help on that Saturday, September 25th, we have another event that we will have more information coming out soon about. Uh, but we are having a haircut ministry here that uh, just lines up just a great time with school kids coming in and pictures coming up that, that we can uh, get get people to, to to show love to these children and provide free haircuts. So we need help with that. Not not help with you coming with your scissors and just uh, <laughs> let me make that clear, all right? Uh, we, we're going to the appropriate people that are, that are in that field, right, Kelly, to, to get those people. And uh, so, but we do need some other volunteers that day. We'll have some bounce houses and some other things uh, just to, to celebrate kids. And, and we will need some other additional help other than getting haircuts. So, so please look at that. Our fall kickoff schedule, um, there's a box over there on the left of that. Our Spark, our Spark Conference, August 12th, okay? There's a schedule there for that. That will be live and also posted later uh, after the event. So if you cannot make it in person that day, those sessions will also be posted after the event, so, so keep that in mind. But if you can make it in person, we will have it in the fellowship hall on the big screen. to see, it was very well done, and I you know, invite you and encourage you to do that on Thursday, August 12th. All right, the Lord's Supper is coming up uh, August 15th, and just a note with that, uh, with the recent COVID levels and stuff like that, we are doing a pre-package again for the Lord's Supper. We are... are waiting to a later date to, to try a uh, regular Lord's Supper, but we will be doing the elements prepackaged only for August 15th. After you're done with that, you can just tear that connect card off, drop those off in the boxes. We are so glad you're here today to worship with us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, God, help us to prepare our hearts and minds so we come before you, Lord, and you are thankful for this new season, this new school season, and, and children uh, moving Sunday school classes as they go up a grade, Lord, and we, uh, uh, Lord, we do not take that like your word and how it will us as, as we will see with the first graders in just a while. Lord, thank you for who you are and who your son is to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today is a day to celebrate God's mercy, God's grace, God's love for us. We're going to do it with this hymn, Wonderful Grace of Jesus. I, I, every once in a while, will hear someone say to me that these new songs, some of them are so difficult. And I just remember learning this song. So friends, 
we're going to sing this song. You're going to remember that people used to be able to sing without a problem. I think you're going to want to use your hymnal for it. It's hymn number 328. Let's stand together and let's sing about the wonderful grace of Jesus. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgression, see it greater far than all my sin and shame, my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise His name. And the last verse. Wonderful grace of Jesus, preaching the most divine, by its transforming power, making Him God's dear child. Full the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountain, sparkling like the fountain, all sufficient grace for even me, broader than the scope of my transgression, sing it, greater far than all my sin and shame, my sin and shame, oh, magnify the precious Jesus, praise His name. Amen. Amen. I invite you all to have a seat if you would. We're going to turn our attention to a very special group of students, and it's a very big deal to move into first grade, and it's such a big deal that another church made a short video about this. Let's watch that. Good morning, Reagan. Good morning. Good morning, Madison. Good morning, Johanna. Good morning, Good morning, Johnny. People are always asking me why. Why do the same thing every year? Why not move on? And I say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Johnny. Present. I'm comfortable. I know the routine. United States of America and to the Republic. And I don't want to brag, but I'm pretty popular around here. I do really well in sports. No! No, not my house! Well, I'm just very successful yes. here. Why would I go and mess that up by graduating? B. But don't. I mean, in the first grade, I may not know all the answers. D. D. Dog. E. The hours are longer. I hear they don't even have nap time. I mean, I just don't see the upside. Then first grade leads to second grade, second to third. Then you're in high school reading boring books with no pictures. Three, four, five. But he was still hungry. Next thing you know, people expect you to get a job and give up summer vacation. <laughs> no, sir. I think I found my niche. Thank you very much. Home sweet kindergarten. Besides, I mean... What if I failed first grade? How humiliating would that be? I love you. Nope, just don't think I could handle that kind of embarrassment.
that was not a good choice. I'm very disappointed. Good morning. What an exciting morning we have had in Children's Sunday School. Our first graders arrived on the fifth floor and lots of things are happening up there for us this year. April Matthews, Jay Mixon and I have the privilege of sharing God's love and digging into the Word of God with our first through fifth graders each and every Sunday morning. And this morning I realized it truly is a privilege to be able to come to Sunday school and be with children and to be with your friends and fellowship with each other every Sunday morning. But this morning we are presenting our first graders with their very own Discoverer's Bible. We are able to use the same Bible each um, Sunday morning to read scripture, to highlight Bible skills, and to learn about Jesus. And these Bibles are given to our children by our church, and they're inscribed with, their child, with your child's name on them, with their name on them. And this morning, we are going to present our first Bible to Brody Johnson. Carter Johnson. Miss Mary Evelyn Miller. And Miss Ellie Ruth Tarver. Would y'all um, bow your heads and have a word of prayer with me this morning? Dear God, thank you for each one of these children, and thank you for their parents, their families that bring them to Sunday school to learn about Jesus. Dear God, we ask that you guide us in children's Sunday school, in each Sunday school class, as we bring your lessons and share your word with these children and children of all ages. Please help us to help them grow in their faith and to grow in your word. I pray that you help us to be bold and to be better witnesses in our daily lives. We ask that you watch over us, God, protect us, and help us to be the light to those around us. And we ask these things in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. And if you all would please stand in honor reading God's word, Miss Abby and Miss Maley. Our Old Testament reading is Psalms 119, 103 through 105. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts. Therefore I hate every wrong path. Your words are a lamp to my feet, and a light to my path. Our New Testament reading is Mark 10, 13 through 16. People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God is like a little child who will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. Let's remain standing as we celebrate and declare God's love for us, God's plan for us, in awe of all that he's done. Jesus. 
that would be enough. It's what God has done for us that we stand in awe of Him. pray with me. Father God, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for this opportunity to come here today to, to worship in your house, Father. And I just ask that you allow us to hear, the, hear you speak, Father, um, as we come today and as we sit here and, and, and worship in your house, Father. I just ask that you um, help remind us of what is truly important, Father, as we, as we watch Miss Candy and, and Ben give Bibles this morning to 
to first graders, or upcoming first graders of this church, Father, I just ask that you remind us that, that we do not worship kindergarten, Father, um, that it is about you. And the future of this church and this nation that we live in is, is, our, is this, these kids, Father, and what they mean to you. Father, I just ask that you remind us that um, they look to you, but Father, um, they look to us to guide them to you, Father. And I just ask that you um, allow us to, to take that opportunity to be the, the, uh, the shepherds of these kids, Father, that, to show them uh, who you are and, and that they are the future of this church and the future of, of this nation. Thank you for all that you've given us. I ask that you lead God and direct us in all that we do. I ask this in your holy and precious name. Amen.
see, there we go. All right, look at all these kids. Good to see you all. Have you all had to go ahead and get some school supplies? Did you all get school supplies? New school supplies? You all started? Some of you all started? Some of you all about to start? Some of you all, you've met your teachers, right? Met your teachers. I brought some school supplies. Watch this. Yes. These little scissors. Marker. Ultra clean washable. Those are the ones you want right there. <laughs> Pencil. Glue sticks. I think teachers prefer the glue sticks, right? Than the runny old glue sometimes. I like post-it notes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What's that? Ruler. Okay. Use that for lots of things. Sometimes just make a straight line. You got to make a straight line for something. Crowns. I didn't bring, you know, everything. And this is just a dry erase racer for a dry erase board. Those are just some school supplies. Now, when you think about this, we've been talking about teachers today, and we've had Sunday school teachers up here. Those are some of our teachers, aren't they? Our Sunday school teachers. Um, we also have our teachers at school. Who else teaches us things? Okay, God. Who else in our life teaches us things? Do our parents teach us things? Yeah, okay. How about coaches? They're kind of like a teacher, right, for a specific sport, right? Coaches. And Jesus was a teacher, okay? Jesus was, uh, even when people were, hadn't discovered he was the son of God yet, they were still trying to, to wrap their minds around that. They were calling him rabbi, rabbi, a teacher, okay? And Jesus is our teacher, actually our ultimate teacher's above any other teacher, right? Should be the most important teacher. He's not just a teacher, but he's the most important teacher, isn't he? And how do we learn what Jesus taught? How do we learn that? Hmm. What did we have up here just a little while ago? So maybe y'all got <gasps> we got it. We gave out Bibles. Yes, we have God's word to help us. How are some other ways we can grow? How else? Who were up? We were handing Bibles out. Who was helping to hand the Bibles out? Huh? Yeah, we. Yeah, Mr. J was up there. Miss Candy were, was up there. So those were just two of our Bible school teachers for kids. Okay, we need other people to help us, don't we? Adults, we need that too. We need other people to help us to learn God's word and to discuss it. And we get insight from one another. You know, I can sit down and read God's word and read a passage I've read over and over before. But then I go into Sunday school, even youth, and they'll bring up something that I've never thought about in a way of the same scripture that I've read. And they'll bring something up. I'm like, wow. And that's, that's also something that helps us to be involved in Bible study and Sunday school. And our, we have teen kid and tiny kid coming up soon. Those are other teachers that are going to be helping us. And those are other ways, okay? So we learn about Jesus, ultimate teacher, through his word and through other people. And I hope that your family, and I, I want you all to, to be here for, in a Sunday school and to be involved, parents, in a Sunday school, because it helps one another grow in God's word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for who you are. Your son is the teacher above all teachers, but not just that. He's our savior. He's our redeemer. God, we know that even when we mess up, when there's mistakes, God, literally, he can erase them, white as snow, in his forgiveness for us. God, but we want to tell other people. We want to help teach others and share with others who Jesus is. And we can do that through God's word, through our, uh, showing people our Bibles and messages and verses in our Bibles and through our Sunday school classes with our other teachers and uh, other kids in there. Lord, so help us as we go into the school year. Let that be a mission field for these children, for their families, Lord, to share Jesus, to invite others to church. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.
All right, K-4 through first grade, you are now invited to Children's Church with Miss April. We'll be heading around that way. Okay. Right, if you'll please take your Bibles and turn, speaking of Bibles, hopefully you bring your Bible when you come to, to worship, take your Bible and turn with me, if you would, to Mark chapter 10. Jesus takes kind of an abrupt break from his teaching on discipleship and his predictions about what's to come in Jerusalem, and it kind of is jarring, it almost seems out of place, but... It reminds us that God's Word speaks to every issue of life. Even when situations come out of nowhere and surprise us, even when we find ourselves taken off guard or we're facing issues in our world that we'd rather just ignore and pretend aren't there, God's Word has something to say. And for those of you that have looked ahead, you understand that this is a difficult passage to preach on. Uh, it's sort of like dancing in, in a minefield this morning as we work through this passage. And that's one of the great things about preaching through a book of the Bible like Mark is God's Word has some things to say on issues and topics. And when it comes up, we address it. We look at what it has to say. And these issues, particularly divorce, is as touchy and debated a topic in the church today as it was 2,000 years ago in Jesus' day. And as I've approached my sermon preparation this week, I want you to know that I've done so with sensitivity, that some people in here do carry deep wounds related to this topic, to a previous marriage, to your personal experience with divorce, or because maybe you have, have experienced unfaithfulness in your marriage. I've seen how divorce affects people, uh, both my own family and uh, my friends, and, uh, and church members, so I understand the, the hurt, the pain that comes with that, and I approach this passage today uh, in humility and with great compassion. But at the same time, we have to approach it with honesty, with faithfulness to God's Word, with submission, submitting to the authority and the truth of God's Word and to the leading of His Spirit. Ultimately, when we wrestle with difficult issues like these, we should find comfort in Scripture. Because no matter what we feel, no matter what we're told, no matter what we're going through, God's Word is honest and it is unwavering in its truthfulness. Its truth does not change. And if you think about it this way, if we will trust our eternal destiny in the hands of Jesus and in what God's Word says, why would we not trust issues in our brief existence on this earth to His hands and what His Word says, even if those are areas that are difficult. So let's look together at Mark chapter 10, and I want to just look at the first two verses to set us up. He set out from there, meaning from the area around the Sea of Galilee. Uh, you know, Jesus has spent most of Mark around Galilee, up in the northern part of Israel, and He has set from there, and He went to the region of Judea. He's heading to Jerusalem. And it says that he does so by going across the Jordan River. And the crowds converged on him again, and as was his custom, he taught them. So Jesus, even as he is on his journey to Jerusalem, he still is teaching the crowds when they come around him. Uh, and, and as he's teaching, the Pharisees came to him to test him, saying, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Now, true to Mark... He doesn't tell us what Jesus is teaching. Mark likes to do that. He just tells us that Jesus is teaching. But based on the question the Pharisees ask and what we know from other Gospels, what Jesus has taught, we can deduce what Jesus is teaching about here. And we can notice that, uh, that, the, that the Pharisees are trying to trap Jesus. They want to get some ammunition from Him on a hot-button topic that they can use against Him, maybe even trying to get Him in trouble with Herod Antipas, because he's traveling now through Herod Antipas's region. If you remember, Herod Antipas had divorced his wife and married his sister-in-law. John the Baptist preached against it, and that's what caused him to lose his head. So maybe the Pharisees are trying to get Jesus in trouble with the law here. And this particular question may also have been prompted by Jesus' teachings. We know that Jesus taught on the sexual ethics of God's kingdom. It's something he addressed at length in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 19, as well as other places. 
And Jesus' teachings often dealt with how we are to relate to and treat other people in a way that is just and right. Like today, issues of marriage and parenting and sex were hot-button issues that needed some godly instruction in Jesus' day. And divorce was an especially relevant topic of debate, especially among the two rabbinical schools of thought. There were two rabbinical schools of thought in Jesus' day, the house of Hillel and the house of Shammai. Now, Mark doesn't go into the details of that the way Matthew does, because remember, Mark is writing to a Roman Christian audience that doesn't care about rabbinical debates. They're not interested in that. So he doesn't give the full question. But if we look at Matthew 19, 3... Matthew puts it this way, some Pharisees approached him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife on any grounds? And that's the debatable part that Mark doesn't include. On any grounds was the source of the debate among these rabbis. Now the followers of Shammai, who held to a very strict interpretation of the law, in fact most of the Pharisees that we meet in the Gospels were followers of Shammai. They were very strict in their interpretation, they believed on any grounds meant divorce was permitted only in the case of indecency. The, the, mainly the wife, because the wife had no recourse to divorce the husband in that day. So if the wife was being unfaithful in some way, not adulterous, because what was the penalty for adultery then? It was murder, it was, it was killing them, executing them, right? Death, not divorce. So not adultery, but maybe she was being a little indecent. Maybe she was being a little forward with, with another man. Something that was certainly scandalous. But the followers of Hillel, who were much more lenient, they were more interested in the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law. And in fact, Jesus, his teachings tended to line up more with Hillel. Uh, the followers of Hillel would have, would have agreed more with Jesus than the, than the typical Pharisee, but not in this case. In this case, the followers of Hillel taught that on any grounds meant just that, any grounds. So literally, the rabbis taught that if the wife were to burn her husband's supper, he could divorce her. If she said something nasty about his mother, he could divorce her. If he went out and saw somebody more attractive, he could write her a certificate of divorce and send her away, and it was over. Women then had no legal recourse. They had no response to that whatsoever. They couldn't instigate a divorce and they couldn't do anything to stop one. Now Jesus isn't interested on whose side he comes down on. He could care less whether people thought he was on Hillel's side or Shammai's side. Today we could say Jesus could care less whether he comes down on the Republican side or the Democrat side. He's not interested in labels like liberal, progressive, conservative, or libertarian. He doesn't care. Jesus is above and beyond that sort of human reasoning because Jesus isn't giving us an opinion or an interpretation. He's giving us the truth. Jesus is the truth. And it's instructive for us to notice how Jesus responds to this question about a current cultural issue regarding ethics and morality, because we've got plenty of those around today. How are we to respond to those? Look what Jesus does in verse 3. He replied to them, what did Moses command you? So how did Jesus answer this question? Did he take an opinion poll? Did he consult the, the latest statistics and social science journals? Did he delve into his opinions or feelings or maybe share an anecdotal story about how a friend or a family member actually experienced personal growth and fulfillment through their divorce? No. What did Jesus do? He went straight to the Word of God. He pointed them back to the Bible. What did Moses command you? That's how we should respond to issues like this. Not that we can't use science or statistics or personal stories to help us relate with people or understand a different perspective or somebody's personal experience, but when it comes to forming our worldview and our perspectives on morality, we need to ground ourselves in the Word of God. What does God's Word say about this issue? Look at verse 4. They responded, Moses permitted us to write divorce papers and send her away. But Jesus told them, He wrote this command for you because of the hardness of your hearts. Now see, both Hillel and Shammai, both of those views on divorce were based on a misreading 
of Deuteronomy 24.1. So let's look at the source material here. What did Moses say? If a man marries a woman, but she becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, he may write her a, a, a divorce certificate, hand it to her, and send her away from his house. Jesus is clarifying that God, through Moses, permitted divorce. He didn't command it. He certainly didn't condone it. It's a permission, and it's a permission that's not a reflection of God's heart. It's a reflection of our hearts. Our hearts that are hardened and corrupted by sin. So the Pharisees, they pointed back to the law of Moses, but Jesus went beyond that. He pointed something far beyond the law of Moses. He went all the way back to the beginning, to Genesis 1 and 2. The Pharisees were focused on debating marriage. Jesus wanted to instruct us on the meaning of marriage. So look at verse 6. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. So, so let's put this in context. Jesus told them, He wrote this command for you because of the hardness of your hearts. That's Moses. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. This is the divine plan. This is God's ideal for human flourishing. And Jesus says that this is the way it was meant to be from the beginning of creation. Jesus is offering us something foundational to marriage, the fundamental truths of how God created us, how He intends us to relate to each other as male and female, as families, as a society. And I want us to use these few verses to outline some fundamental truths about marriage according to Genesis and Jesus, not according to David. And if someone wants to know what Jesus is teaching about these things, about gender and sexuality and marriage, here you are. Here's Jesus' words about these topics that are so relevant to us today. And the first fundamental truth I want us to look at is the foundation of marriage. God's design for marriage. Jesus goes back beyond Deuteronomy to Genesis 1.27 that says, So God created man in His own image, in the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. It's amazing. Genesis 1 through 3 tells us really everything we need to know about humanity. Beginning with the sacredness of all people. Our infinite worth as bearers of the image of the infinitely worthy God. And you know what that means? That means that every person you ever see, talk to, encounter, meet, everyone, every person, every person should be treated with love and value and dignity. No ifs, ands, or buts. That's the first thing. But the second thing we see is that God made us in His image, male and female. This tells us that gender and sexuality are gifts from God to be used for His glory and our good. These things allow men and women to express their love and commitment to one another with intimacy and submission and sacrifice in a way that honors the image of God in each other. And they, they are what allow humanity to fulfill God's command to multiply and fill the earth. We call this commitment that allows these things to happen marriage. And help us use those gifts in the best way God gave us commands not to be oppressive, not to rob us of, of joy, but to free us from selfishness and from sin's oppression so that we can live lives of fullness and harmony and joy. Those commands are there to protect us and marriage. Listen, the gender theories of today, especially the transgender ideology, they depend on a lie. A lie that says that our biological sex can be wrong. They even reject the reality of the binary sexes. But the Bible tells us God created us male and female and thousands of years of human history and, and legal precedent and philosophy, not to mention biology and genetics, attest to the reality 
of the binary sexes of male and female. And God created us in His image, male and female, before sin entered the picture. That means that our sex, whether we are male or female, is good. That's good. And it's good because men and women demonstrate different aspects of of God's nature in a way the others cannot. We are created in His image, male and female. That means that men get to reflect a part of God's image that women don't, and women get to reflect a part of God's image that men don't. We need each other to give a clear picture of who God is. But we understand we don't live purely in a Genesis 1 and 2 world, do we? We live in a good world, created by God, but marred, twisted, broken by the events of Genesis 3. And naturally, this has impacted us in every way, sexually, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, relationally. Remember, the very first result of Adam and Eve's sin was shame over their bodies. Remember that? They covered themselves to hide from each other. They hid behind a bush to hide from God because they were afraid, because they were naked. They were ashamed of the bodies God gave them, ashamed of the gender God had made them. So we should not be surprised by the confusion and brokenness in our world when it comes to gender and sexuality and marriage. Satan's been lying to people about these things from the beginning and he lies to us today about them still. And like Adam and Eve, our culture has rejected God's order and has set up a morality of its own. A reality that's not based on revealed scripture. A reality that's not based on any ultimate truth. A morality that's, that's not based on the undeniable nature of reality. It's a morality that's set up by consensus, by opinion polls. Our culture effectively is saying, who needs God to tell me what I can and can't do, who I am and am not? We want to be the ultimate authority and decide for ourselves what is right and what is true. Listen, nobody denies the reality of gender dysphoria. Nobody denies the reality that because of sin, people can be confused and, and there can be a conflict between their sense of self and their body. The difference is the Christian worldview considers the body to be right and the belief to be wrong. But the current worldview has that backwards. It's what you believe that's correct. Your body is what needs to be brought into submission. But here's the good news. The good news is that God has given us His truth. He's given us the truth. And through Jesus, God is at work redeeming sinners, rescuing people from the brokenness and the lies of sin. Jesus is not only the healer of bodies, but also of the confusion of gender dysphoria and same-sex attraction and the healer of sick and broken marriages. Based on the givenness of our gendered selves, we receive this from God. Jesus says it is for this reason that a man and a woman are joined together in marriage. And that brings us to the second fundamental truth, the formation of marriage. Involving this leaving and cleaving. So Jesus has gone from Genesis 1 to Genesis 2. In Genesis 2.24 it says, This is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife and they become one flesh. Now what does that mean? What does it mean to leave your parents and cleave to your wife? Well the Greek word for leave literally means to leave behind. To depart. It's the word we might use if you're going on a trip and you depart from home to go somewhere else. Cleaving literally means being glued together, being joined together in a permanent fashion. That's what that word means. And together, leaving and cleaving tells us that the marriage relationship is something that is unique and exclusive. It's nothing like the relationship between parents and children, between siblings, or even between friends. Marriage is a relationship that is set apart and special. But why is it that the husband must leave his his father, mother, and cleave to his wife? Why isn't it the other way around? Because that tells us that the fundamental duty of the husband is especially significant. His priority is no longer his parents, his past, or his pleasures. His priority is his wife. 
His love for her must transcend all other loves and commitments in this world, except, of course, your love for and commitment to Jesus, which is expressed in how you love and care for your wife. Paul tells us that when a husband loves his wife in this way, he is powerfully portraying Jesus' sacrificial and selfless love for his bride, the church, as he left his Father in heaven and came to be united with us. And when Paul writes about that in Ephesians 5, like Jesus, he also points back to Genesis 1 and 2. But then Paul overlays the events of the cross and the tomb. He overlays the gospel on marriage. He says that marriage should reflect Jesus' love for the church, his bride, who he sacrificially laid down his life for. And that tells us that the love between a husband and a wife should be a self-sacrificing, submitting, servant-hearted love. And like Jesus' commitment to those of us who trust in Him, it's a love that should be steadfast and never failing. As I constantly remind couples and congregations when I do weddings, marriage is an enduring and exclusive partnership of love and devotion whereby God takes two equal yet distinct individuals and makes them one. That's the formation of marriage. We leave behind the past and we cleave, we become united in a permanent way with our spouse. And that brings us to the fusion that happens in marriage. It's an intimate bond that takes place there. Now our culture has marriage all backwards. You know, it emphasizes this romanticized, sentimental, fairy tale view of marriage, you know, where you, you live happily ever after, and, and the expectation is that your spouse is going to somehow complete you and make you whole. But there's, you know, as with many things, a kernel of truth there. I mean, the whole image of the two becoming one flesh is this idea of us being able to complete something in each other. You know, it's like two puzzle pieces that come together to present the picture. But that doesn't mean that sex and marriage exist solely for your personal happiness and fulfillment. For one thing, when you place an expectation on somebody that they're going to fix you, or that they're going to somehow complete you, or they're going to help you experience some sort of self-personal fulfillment, you know what you've done to that person? You've turned them into a god. You've idolized them and put them on a pedestal. There's only one person in our life we should turn to for those kinds of deep, personal, spiritual needs, and that's Jesus Christ, not your spouse. Your spouse is not God. And many of you are saying, you got that right. (laughs) But we also need to see that marriage is a calling. Listen, marriage is not a right. Marriage is not a foregone conclusion. Marriage is not something that everyone is entitled to have. If there's nothing else that the rampant divorce in our culture has showed us, it's that not everyone is called to be married. And it's a shame that so many lives have to be damaged before people can realize this. Marriage is a calling. And it's a commitment. And it isn't about you. It's about your spouse. It's about your children. And ultimately, it's about Jesus Christ and His gospel. It's not about you. Now, this, of course, should go without saying, but given today's culture, there is obviously a physical sexual dimension to the idea of the two becoming one flesh. And the Greek word that's used there in Mark chapter 10 is the word sarx. It's where we get the word sarcophagus from, right? Where you put a body. So this word means literal body, flesh, not just becoming one in a spiritual sense, but in a physical sense. The Hebrew word used in Genesis is also often translated meat. So it's very much a physical sort of idea. The Bible is clear that one of the fundamental purposes of marriage is procreation. God commanded humanity, as He did all living things, to be fruitful and to multiply after their kind. And to accommodate this, God created the concept of sexual reproduction, of male and female. But today, marriage has been redefined to be only about fulfilling the personal desires of two adults regardless of their gender and without any thought whatsoever to children. Ryan T. Anderson, who I highly recommend, he writes extensively on this, 
He offers this assessment. In recent decades, marriage has been weakened by a revisionist view that is more about adults' desires than children's needs. This reduces marriage to a system to approve emotional bonds or distribute legal privileges. In essence, the push for same-sex marriage reduces that intimate bond of marriage to something that's just for personal fulfillment and enjoyment, and that's all. It makes marriage exactly what I said it wasn't. It's not about me. It's not about you. But the redefinition of marriage has made it all about you. Anderson goes on to give this succinct summary of the biblical and, you know, before 15 minutes ago, widely held view of marriage and why it should matter to everyone. He says, marriage is based on the truth that men and women are complementary. The biological fact that reproduction depends on a man and a woman and the reality that children need a father and a mother. Redefining marriage does not simply expand the existing understanding of marriage, it rejects these truths. Listen to this sentence. Marriage is society's least restrictive means of ensuring the well-being of children. What happens when marriages fall apart? What happens when children are raised in homes by just a mom or just a dad? Oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes what happens? The government has to step in more, doesn't it? Government programs have to fill in that gap. And so he says, by encouraging the norms of marriage... Monogamy, sexual exclusivity, and permanence. The state strengthens civil society and reduces its own role. The future of this country depends on the future of marriage. The one flesh bond of marriage only works, it only makes sense between a man and a woman committed to each other at the exclusion of all others. And whether that marriage actually produces children or not does not negate the fundamental understanding of why God created marriage. That's the fusion of marriage, the, 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 in, the, the intimate bond that happens as the two become one flesh. But then we see the fixture of marriage. Not only is it an intimate bond, it's an inseparable bond. Without a doubt, Jesus saw marriage as a lifelong commitment between one man and one woman. And until recently, that lifelong commitment part used to be the controversial part. <laughs> of what Jesus said. I think few of us would argue that the ideal for marriage is until death do us part. Listen, I've done many marriages, many weddings. And when that that groom and bride stand there and they say those vows to each other and they say till death do us part, they mean it. There's not a one of them standing there that day thinking about divorce. They believe they're going to be together for the rest of their lives. And God clearly states His desire for such a lifelong commitment, this inseparable bond between husband and wife. He talks about it from Genesis to Jesus, from Proverbs to Paul. God may have permitted divorce, but time and again, He celebrates marriage. He created it. God is the one who joins together a husband and a wife. And Jesus says, if God joins them together, how can anyone presume to separate it. That's akin to someone presuming to take a life that God has given. God has some strong words about this in Malachi chapter 2. He says, The Lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful to the wife of your youth. The man who hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord, the God of Israel, does violence to the one that he should protect. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful. Now some translations uh, translate that part that says uh, the man who hates and divorces his wife, they translate that say that God hates divorce. Either way, I think the text is clear. God hates divorce. I think that God sees divorce like he sees death. It's an intruder, an interruption in his good creation, in his divine order. And that brings us to the final fundamental truth here, and that's the failure of marriage, which is divorce. Let's pick it up in verses 10 through 12. So when they were in the house again, as often happens, Jesus and the disciples then retreat from the public into a house, and that's where the disciples ask questions, and they they dig a little bit deeper. The disciples questioned him about this matter. He said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. Also, if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. 
So remember, Jesus answered the question about divorce by focusing on the fundamental truths of marriage. But the disciples, once again, failed to appreciate what Jesus is saying, so they go back to the question of divorce again. I mean, Jesus basically threw all the loopholes on marriage of the Pharisees, he threw them out the window. And this was huge, this was revolutionary. So the disciples are struggling with what this means. Now, as I said earlier, we live in a world after Genesis 3. Because of sin and the hardness of the human heart, our world is broken. And all too often that brokenness is reflected in broken marriages. Listen to me clearly. God's heart is always to heal what is broken. His heart is always for restoration and reconciliation. But God also mercifully makes allowance and gives protective instruction for dealing with those marriages that just cannot be healed. The Pharisees use these permissions and these instructions as a license to justify their self-centered behavior and to cheapen the marriage vows. They saw divorce as a convenient way out of an unhappy relationship. They saw it as a means of personal fulfillment, much as some people do today. We have to acknowledge that divorce exists because of our hard hearts. And listen, hard hearts don't happen overnight. They can take years to develop. Divorce happens because someone in that marriage hasn't been obeying God. They've not been living out His intention for marriage. Maybe there's been a lack of true Christian submission. A lack of selfless service and sacrificial love. Maybe somebody's been unwilling to forgive. Or maybe it's just selfishness. Now, of course, <clears throat> in case of abusiveness or neglect, <clears throat> excuse me, or adultery, or addictions that, that make life difficult, if not dangerous, of course, in those situations, sometimes divorce is the only, is the only solution. It's the lesser of two evils, if you will. The Bible only gives us three examples of when divorce is permissible. One Jesus mentions is, un, is marital unfaithfulness. If one spouse is being unfaithful. Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 mentions divorce when an unbelieving spouse just walks away and abandons the family, ostensibly because he refuses to, or she refuses to convert uh, to Christianity. And then the Old Testament gives allowance for divorce in cases of neglect and abuse. And, and of course the interpretation of these can be, can be very wide. But I want us to be clear. Jesus is not substituting one form of legalism with another in his teaching. <clears throat> He's illustrating something about the sanctity of marriage and the gravity of divorce, which is never God's ideal. Again, among Christians, divorce should never be celebrated. It should always be mourned. You have to realize that if someone divorces and remarries within biblical guidelines, that itself is not a sin, even though it can be the result of sin. Divorce is like death. It's an intrusion into God's very good creation. It's not a part of His plan or His intent for us. And like death, it exists because of sin. As Jesus says, it's because of the hardness of our hearts. In his book, Gray Areas, Mike Glenn writes this. He says, the decision to divorce or not is not ours to make. It's God's. If you've done everything in your power to reconcile the marriage, and God has given you permission to leave, then you may leave. But reconciliation and the attempt to salvage the marriage commitment should always be the first priority. Now what can we do as churches? How can we put our money where, the, where our mouth is on this? We should be celebrating, honoring, and strengthening marriages. We should grieve every divorce and strive to reduce the number of divorces, especially among believers. And there's a, a few things we can do to make that more likely. We, first of all, need to take marriage more seriously. Respecting its sacredness and explaining its meaning and purpose from the pulpit and in Sunday school classes and premarital counseling and even in wedding ceremonies, which I, I try to do. Second, our church should be a safe place for married and engaged couples to talk about their relationships to strengthen or prepare for their marriages so that those small cracks and faults and stresses don't become gaping chasms. And we need to be a community where older married couples are taking younger married couples under their wings to mentor them and to help walk with them through those difficult times. 
We need to be a safe place where people can be honest about their struggles and doubts. Where they can find hope and help and healing, not empty platitudes, not plastered on smiles, and certainly not judgmental looks. And third, we must help those who have been touched by divorce to find healing, grace, and forgiveness. We need to be ready to help them pick up the pieces. Find God's healing balm for their wounds. Help them offer forgiveness where that's necessary and give them the support they need to move forward. Thank God that He's a God of mercy and grace. Amen? He's a God of mercy and grace. God is an expert at bringing beauty from the ashes and life from death. And when a marriage fails, remember that God's word always, always, always gets the last word. God's grace reigns supreme. And if marriage is a part of your past, or if divorce is a part of your past, you know where that divorce remains? In your past. God is interested in who you are today and in helping you move forward in a way that glorifies Him and honors the image of God in the relationships in your life. But listen, that's true for every failure. That's true for every sin. That's true for every setback in our lives. When we are in Christ, those things are behind us. We don't bring them with us. Jesus died and rose from the grave so that we could become a part of His family. Jesus offers to wash away your sins, to leave your past in the past. He wants to do away with the shame and bring newness of life to you. And listen, Jesus' love will never walk out on you. Jesus' love will always be faithful and true to you, no matter what. No matter what you've done. Listen, this morning, God already knows all the skeletons in your closet. You're not hiding any secrets from Him, and He loves you anyway. And He beckons you to come, to trust in Him. He wants to give you a fresh start, a new beginning. He wants to set you free if you would come. Maybe this morning here in a minute as we sing, you need to come and say, I want to enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Yes, I've got, I've got a past that I'm ashamed of. Yes, I've done things that I know were wrong. Yes, I carry woundedness with me right now, and I want Jesus to heal my heart and my soul. I want Him to heal my relationships and make me new. This morning, you can experience that today. Maybe this morning He's calling you to unite with this church. You know, the church is the bride of Christ. And Paul says that Jesus is preparing His bride and cleansing His bride for His return. You know what that means? That means that we're not perfect. That means that we're in process. And listen, we're not a perfect church. But we invite you to join us on the journey of becoming more like Jesus. And maybe this morning God is convicting you and you need to recommit your life as a husband, as a wife, as a mother or father. You need to recommit yourself to marital fidelity, to sexual purity. Maybe you need to, maybe you need to say, you know, I need to be working on my relationship with my spouse and, and I've been selfish and I've been holding on to the past and I need to lay these things down. Listen, this altar is open for you to come and pray and I'll be standing here. No judgment. No judgment. Maybe you need to come and pray for somebody you know that's struggling. Maybe you've got to come and pray about something not at all related to anything I've said today. But if God is speaking to your heart, that's what this time is about. For you to respond, for you to pray, for you to recommit yourself. Let's stand together and let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us as we are. Lord, you know everything we've said, everything we've thought, everything we've done. You know our wounds, you know our mistakes. And Father, you don't ask us to go back and to do anything with those, to fix them in any way. You only ask us to confess them to you, to place them in your hand, and to receive your grace and forgiveness. For your spirit to indwell us and help us to turn away from those sinful choices and begin to walk in newness of life in the footsteps of Jesus. And if there's anyone here today that needs to do that, I pray they would. Father, help us to come alongside each other, to encourage one another, to pray for each other, to hold confidences with each other. God, may we be a family of faith that we can truly struggle and wrestle with our issues with people that we trust and love, and we can help each other along. Lord, none of us have any room to judge anyone because we all have our own brokenness and our own issues. They just might be different from someone else's. 
But Father, what we must all do is we must all cling to the truth of your word and must walk in faith and trust in your intention for us, not what the world says, not what maybe we feel, but what you say, believing that you will see us through the storm and that it's better on the other side. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You come as God's Spirit leads you this morning. Living for Jesus, the life that is true. building or online or on the radio, I want you to know that my door is open and my phone is at my side. If anybody ever needs somebody to listen or to pray with them or for counsel, I want you to know we are here to help you, whatever you're struggling with. And especially if you're struggling in your marriage or you're dealing with some other issues, uh, please don't suffer alone. You've got pastors in a church that truly love you and we want to come alongside of you and help you in any way. And so please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, life is hard, and it's messy, and it's complicated. And we need the truth of God to guide us, and we need the grace of God to cover us. And we're so thankful to have a church that believes in both. And we give as we go as a way to help strengthen marriages, not only here but around the world through the International Mission Board, through North American Missions, uh, through our own ministry to couples and, and to families here at First Baptist Church. We can give and be a part of the solution, not the problem, in our world today. So I pray that you would give cheerfully as you go. Hope you'll come back next week to, uh, as we move on in Mark and as we celebrate the Lord's Supper together, come ready to give an offering to our benevolent offering to help those in need in our community. Uh, let's pray, and then we're going to sing that chorus one more time as we go. Father, thank you for your grace, your truth, and your love. I pray that your light would shine in our lives and help us to shine that light brightly into this world that is so dark and so confused and so lost. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's have the grace of God on our mind as we go. Let's sing together. Oh, wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea. Higher than the mountains, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for me. Broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame, my sin and shame. Who magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise His name. And God bless you as you go.
good. How are you?